In this, our first period of the day, our thoughts have been led from the Word of God by our brother Frank Abel from the book Road Ontario, Canada, Ecclesia. Brother Frank has led our thoughts under the theme, Fruit of the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. And today, our brother Frank will speak to us on the subject, Mankind's Response to Evil. Brother Frank. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. It's a, an interesting thing in developing a theme over a number of classes to, to be uh, reasonably sure that in the way it's divided out that there is uh, something of substance in each of the sections. And I must say that this class, uh, I wrestled with this one and uh, you will be the judge as to whether I wrestled with it right. But it's mankind's response to evil in terms of what we learned yesterday of God's intention with creating evil so that good may come out of it. So there might be some latter blessing to the person involved or the nation involved, etc. And the only way that we can really learn from this is learn from basically people's mistakes. There are some cases, we will deal with a few of them, of where people actually reacted and, and uh, it turned out well for them. But there's so many cases where they didn't respond properly, like they really didn't do what God intended. Although God in, intended with chastening to bring them back and to and to bring honor and glory to his name, uh, they didn't respond. So you, you wonder whether it's really useful to go over that material, like how can we benefit from it? So that's the key this morning, to try to see that there is reasons to go over those things and uh, to benefit from it. So just by way of review of our class three, man sins, and God creates evil to rehabilitate those he loves. So that's a principle we're working on. We know we sin, we know we have sinned, we know we will sin, but we know that the process that God works with us is to rehabilitate us. And it may be that we'll have to learn under God's effective use of evil. And he has used evil to bring good out of it. So as we talked yesterday, some of God's promises, promises that is, are rooted in evil. So that we, we have to be thinking about what's happened to us and connecting it with what God's word says to see that God's trying to, trying to react to the situation that we've discovered we're in and to bring us out of it. So if God can create evil and, and all things really turn out for good in the latter end, there's a promise in that, that even though we're in the depths of despair over what's happened, we trust that somehow, some way, God will work with us to get out of this and it will turn out good. And it's important, I think, to be able to look back and see some examples of where that happened and maybe even some close examples in our own life and some people we know. So some erring brethren were delivered unto Satan or evil for rehabilitation and good. And in many ecclesias, we've had to face the fact that when people don't come to the ecclesia and it's prolonged absence, their own decision not to come, that we've had to disfellowship them as we would use that term. And uh, if everything worked as we would hope it worked, with everybody understanding that as it is supposed to be understood, recovery is possible where people come to their senses and, and want to come back, but I'm not sure that that's a, a good example to work in because in many cases it, it hasn't really worked out properly. People didn't understand what they were doing and uh, hence 
it maybe didn't have a good opportunity to work out. But when we look at the examples of God's analogy of purification of metals as a reminder of the object of chastening, and we can get something like a figure in our mind like that, that the only way God can do things to separate in, in our own minds the, the good things from the bad things is, is to heat it up. He doesn't turn on heat as a burner on a stove. It creates circumstances which work like heat. But it can't be separated until the metals melt. And depending what metals are mixed in with the ones that God wants to really preserve, the valuable metals, it may have to get very hot to melt them. Otherwise, all you do is you melt some uh, metals, but you don't melt them all. So you you can well imagine people have to go through a, a real battle in their life to come out with uh, a better quality of silver than they had to start with. But through the work of his son, God has brought us out of an evil background, as we learned last night with Brother Jesse's address. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to think of, to be reminded of, and to actually meditate over as to you know, what, hopeless, what a hopeless situation it was for us, regardless of where we were uh, when we became baptized and where we are now, and how God is working through us. It's, it's a lovely concept. So this idea of mankind's response to evil is our, is our class subject this morning. Now the response of Adam and Eve, as we see it in its first appearance, is they covered their sexual members. They felt naked. As the passage goes on to say, the eyes of them were both opened. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, rather than seeing that as some embarrassing part of the scripture we don't really want to look into, we don't really want to talk about, there's something there that we need to know. And we're going to spend a little time trying to develop that as we go through this uh, class this morning. So why would God attach it that way, that as soon as they had eaten of that tree, the eyes of them, or at least the first thing that the record tells us, is the eyes of them were opened and they knew they were naked. You know, we must wonder sometimes why it is we have that feeling about nakedness. You know, one of the the, the dreams I've had that uh, it sort of bothers me quite a bit. I don't know whether it's, it's related to just uh, speaking at a Bible school or not, but I've, I've had that dream so many times that I've, I've had to come to a Bible school to give a class and I couldn't find my clothes. You know, and I thought, well, I'm not going to go in there like this. <laughs> and it's, a, it's a really an uncomfortable feeling and you don't know why those, those thoughts even occur. But there's, there's something about the way we are structured relative to what happened in that first sin. It's made us like this. So all of us have inherited this idea that we know when we're naked and we want to cover ourselves. But God's speaking much more than just the nakedness of our bodies because they hid themselves so that they wouldn't really be able to be seen by the, uh, El- the Elohim at that time, even with their fig leaves on. So there, there was more to it than just covering their physical parts. They were ashamed of what they had done. And that's the thing that is uh, so important to consider, that quite apart from how we might be able to cover up things from other people's view, we've we got to deal with our mind, because our, our mind if we have committed the sin that we haven't been forgiven for or we haven't even sought forgiveness for, we have a guilt associated with God instituted that we would feel guilty. And that must be one of the greatest reliefs that people have is to be relieved of that guilt and to feel that having gone and asked for forgiveness that they are forgiven. But I want to stay with Adam and Eve in that first initial family. I, I think it's, it's really just the way God wants us to see this, that he didn't reveal more about Adam and Eve's later life. He could really like to know how it worked out with Adam and Eve. 
did they, you know, come to God? Uh, did they, they really, you know, gravitate to him? Did they try to teach their children the way of God? Did they, well, we don't know that. And it's wisdom, I think, that we don't know that. So the first person we get to know about is Cain. And Cain was quite a character. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this man because we get to know a little bit about Adam and Eve's response in the sense that look at what they had to go through. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the grief of mind that would be to Adam and Eve to have one of your sons kill one of your other sons? in a rage, went out and killed him. How would you as a parent live with that? Never mind how Cain lived with it. So there was something about Cain that we need to look into. So it says in chapter 4, verses 3 to 5, in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto Yahweh. And Abel he also brought of the first things of his flock, and the fat thereof. And Yahweh had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Now that tells you, doesn't it, something about the man, because although you might understand he could be upset with his brother for doing something to him, but he was upset with God, that God wouldn't accept what he had brought. In other words, God should be able to understand that I, I did this with the best of my heart, out of the best of my intentions, and here it is, God. Why can't you accept that? But you see, that's a, a major problem for people today who come to God thinking that they can determine how to serve God and uh, expect that God would accept their service. I did it out of the best of my heart. I, I did these things by putting my money and my energy into it. Why can't you accept it? But God will not accept that. He only accepts what he has told people he will accept. Reconciliation is to God to decide and to set. And unless you believe, you know, the things that we've talked about, and certainly that you already believe about God being our potter, so he's not only our creator, he's shaping us, then you might just fall into the lot of the, of the idea of Cain. <clears throat> So it goes on to say in verse 6 of chapter 4 that Yahweh said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And Yahweh said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Now again, the measure of Cain. If you had accidentally killed your brother, like you, you were fighting with him and you hit him and you, you didn't expect to hit him that hard that he died, you, you would expect there would, you would be totally, uh, you know, upset and, and uh, come to God with just you know, tears and shame that you had done that, but not Cain. Am I my brother's keeper? How do we ever account for a man of that character, the very first child that's born? And that's a little bit of the challenge that we have in looking at Cain. In Genesis 4, verse 12, it says, when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto Yahweh, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And Cain's just thinking about me. Like he doesn't think about God. He doesn't think about God being offended. He doesn't think about his brother. He doesn't think about his parents. It's me. And this is the me generation we're dealing with. So we really have to, to try to see something in these examples because th there must be something that we can obtain from this. That self-pity is always very destructive for a person who wants to pity themselves and wants you to pity them. I think we have to be very careful of that. 
when uh, Peter was very upset with the Lord saying that he had to go and be crucified, it, essentially what he said to, to the Lord was, Pity thyself, O Lord, this shall not come unto thee. And Jesus' reply was very sharp to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Because that's something that the Lord would not tolerate, is, is uh, you know, getting involved in self-pity and where that would lead one to, thinking about self and what he had to go through. He was stealing himself to bear what he had to go through at that time. So it says, And Yahweh said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And Yahweh set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of Yahweh and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Now it's interesting how there's an interface here. There's a couple issues that come into the Bible for us today at this page. Because we find that this idea of Cain going out into the land of Nod and there finding his wife has caused people to say, well, where did he get this wife from? Like, that's a, that's a real problem. And, uh, well, just before I get into that one, I'll just comment on this a little bit further. So we have people thinking, well, there, maybe there were, there were others that were living on the earth, and that he picked out his wife from some people that, or some beings that were out there at the same time. I think maybe you've heard of that, because that's become popular amongst those who are advocating it that really there were other beings that intermarried with the human race at this time. But if Adam and Eve, as we mentioned earlier, lived as long as they did, and Adam lived after he, he and, uh, and Eve had Seth for 800 years and bare sons and daughters, and it never mentions any of the daughters, you know, dates being born or, or sequence being born, there's ample room in the text to understand that he would have married his sister, rightly, at that time. There's no need to come and to think of being somewhere else that, that uh, Cain would have found and been able to marry and, and sort of merge with the human race. Our safety, brothers and sisters, is to stay with what the Bible says and not be dragged into believing what the Bible does not say. And that's, I think, going to be our salvation in these times when we're, we're finding people that are attacking what we have believed by saying, well, Genesis is, is maybe part of the facts, but it's not all the facts. No, we can stay with what the Bible says and be quite comfortable that it can all be accounted for. That if he went out and dwelt in the land of Nod, away from the presence of Yahweh, he went out to marry, or went out with a wife, one of his sisters. And that's the way we've always looked at it, as far as I know, and I think that is quite satisfactory still. Now, here's where it gets into a little, takes Cain a little bit different road. And it, uh, it comes into this from 1 John 3, verse 11 and 12. It says, this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. Who was the wicked one? You see, you have to answer that. If, if the Apostle John was to say that he was of Adam, well, we'd understand that. He was of Adam, but no, he says he was of that wicked one and slew his brother, almost as if that's the reason why he slew his brother, because he was of that wicked one. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Now, Brother Thomas gives us an explanation for this, which is really valuable. I just want to read this, since there's three slides here. And I want you just to listen to this as we go through it. He says, as I have remarked before, sin is personified by Paul as preeminently a sinner. Sin personified by Paul as preeminently a sinner and by another apostle as the wicked one and slew his brother. There is precision in this language which is not to be disregarded in the interpretation. K 
Cain was of the wicked one. That is, he was a son of sin, of the serpent sin, or original transgression. The mosaic narrative of facts is interrupted at the end of the sixth verse of the third chapter. If you have your Bibles open, you might tell us, just see that. He says this, the mosaic narrative of facts is interrupted at the end of the sixth verse of the third chapter. The fact passed over there, though implied in the seventh verse, is plainly stated in the first verse of the fourth chapter. <clears throat> then he says, okay, now these texts conjoined, these texts conjoined read thus, and Eve gave unto her husband, and he did eat with her, and Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and the eyes of them both opened, they knew that they were naked. Oh, that's interesting. Now here was a conception in sin, the originator of which was the serpent. When therefore in the set time afterwards, Eve bare Cain, though procreated by Adam, he was of the serpent, seeing he suggested that he suggested the transgression which ended in the conception of Cain. In this way, sin in the flesh being put for the serpent, Cain was of that wicked one, the preeminent sinner, and the firstborn of the serpent's seed. Now, if it takes you 10 times to read that, to, to make sure at least you understand what Brother Thomas is saying, that's fine because sometimes it takes that much time to see what he's saying. But however my mind, I found in my experience with Brother Thomas's writings, however, I, I sort of repel it, some of the thoughts he initially comes up with, but I've come back to him and I think this man really understood his Bible. And he could see that this conception was really related to what happened to Eve when she ate of the fruit and that the conception took place before Adam ate of the fruit. And so it's right in the middle of that that Cain is conceived. Let's just go on. Every son of Adam is conceived in sin and shapen in iniquity. Every son. And therefore sinful flesh on the principle that what is born of the flesh is flesh if he obeys the impulses of his flesh, he is like Cain of the wicked one. But if he believe the exceeding great and precious promises of God, obey the law of faith, and put to death unlawful obedience to his propensities, he becomes a son of the living God, a brother and a joint heir of the Lord Jesus Christ of the glory to be revealed in the last time. Now, I've read this before, maybe a, a several times before. I never noticed this. It, I noticed this when I was trying to figure this out, and I went back to Brother Thomas, and I, I read it again and again. I thought, no, there really is a point here. But the point was made with me by now reading Psalm 51. And seeing how David, when he's confessing his sin, said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Well, what is the mother he's referring to? Was it David's literal mother, or was it Eve? Because if you read what Brother Thomas is saying, he, he's saying that every son is born in this sense, in the sense that we're born of Eve. So it wasn't, you know, speaking disparagingly about David's mother, there's nothing disparagingly we can find in the record about his mother. No, it's speaking about the fact that we all inherit this, this tendency, which can either be taken to, you know, just to live out the propensities or the desires or the natural inclinations of the flesh, or we can discipline it so that we can manifest the works of the Spirit. That's again, you see, going back to the idea of the battle in our mind. We all know what those propensities are. We all live because we have hormones that are 
that are going through our body at various times, and they're, they can be stirred. They can, they can make us alert to things that we wouldn't normally be alert to. We have to decide whether to, to deal with that and, and put a limit on it or let it run its way, which is what we see in the world about us. And God's laws, one after another, just fall until we disregard God altogether. As a community, brothers and sisters, we are trying to curtail that. We want to win that battle in the mind. We want to be able to control the flesh. So if we believe these things, just going back to what Brother Thomas said, every son of Adam is conceived in sin and shapen in iniquity, and therefore sinful flesh, we can really understand that our battle is to win it in our minds and not allow what we just think of, well, what we'd like to do. And I, I think that is so important that when we are raising our children, as soon as we can do it, to try to get the kids not to just, you know, have everything they want, to, to learn at the earliest stage to practice discipline, to be able to tell themselves, no, I'm not going to have it. Not because mom said it, because I don't want to have it. Isn't that the, the wonderful thing we, we love to hear in our children as they grow up through the ages of maturity? They don't tell other people, well, I can't do that because mom and dad won't let me do that. No, but they say, I can't do that because I don't want to do that. I don't believe that's right. So a child is taking control of their life, and they can see that they want to be led by a philosophy, a belief, rather than, that's the rule of our house, you can't do that here but I'd love to do it, but I can't do it here. That's the kind of thing we want to make sure that our children get a hold of. Every son of Adam is conceived in sin and shapen in iniquity. And that's a scriptural quotation. That's coming from John. It's not as if the John Thomas made that up. So we just leave that and go on to a few other cases of where people had difficulty with the evil that was before them. Now, in Numbers 13, we've talked about this, but I'd just like to, to see it again. In Numbers 13, verses 31 to 33, Israel at the border. The men that went up with him said, We be not able to go against the people. They are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that were it, what we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were they, and so were we in their sight. Now that's basically being motivated by fear. No wonder God tells us that there won't be people who are, are governed by fear in his kingdom. Because if you're governed by fear, you haven't developed faith. Faith is supposed to overcome fear. Like, what was the difference between Caleb and the others? You know, what Joshua included, but Caleb was the one that singled out in his testimony. Well, the facts were that he, he just felt God can do these things. Look at what God's done for us in the past. These people will fall just like any others have fallen before us. And everybody else did not see it that way. Doesn't that give us a little inclination as to how certainly the ideas of faithlessness and fear can be permeated through a whole congregation just by one person or a group of people with a representative, say, standing up and saying, no, we can't go. We don't stand a chance. We'd just go up there to, to die and to be killed by people, and our children would die up there. And that's uh, what Caleb did not see or recognize. So the difference between faith and fear is one of the big things that makes people make those decisions. In Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness? Now notice it says in verse 1, All the congregation. And in verse 2, All the children of Israel. And again, the whole congregation. So God's not telling us, Well, you know, there's 
I only looked at a few people and I thought they were all like this. But well, God could determine this was the reaction of all the people. It just went through them like wildfire. And they were all of this mind. Would God we had died in the land of Egypt or would God we had died in this wilderness? Now that's really evil talking by people who had gone through the Red Sea, had seen the, the Egyptians floating on the shore side in the morning. They were dead. They, they all succumbed without them having to lift up a sword or a spear. God had saved them by a, a miracle. He had fed them. He had given them water out of a rock. And yet this was the outcome. How do you account for that, brothers and sisters? How do you account that they were just faithless at the time, the critical time it was to have faith? And I wonder if those 40 days of waiting, that time of idleness, where they really didn't do anything, they were just waiting for the spies to come back, is the way we really are unprepared for spiritual growth. I mean, Jesus, as we mentioned again, Jesus said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. It would appear to me that neither of those things were being done by the congregation. For the whole congregation to fall in one night. We're people. We're descendants of Adam and Eve. We have sinful flesh. We've got to try, brothers and sisters, to make sure it does not happen to us. Now, it's interesting in this record in Deuteronomy that we find this because we don't find this otherwise. It looks in other ways in which it records how they went into the land that God told them to send the spies. But when we see this record, we start to see a little more of why these people were so faithless. In verse 22 of Deuteronomy 1, And you came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search us out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must come up, and into what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, and one of a tribe. Well, you sort of wonder, was that all the truth? Or was it just what they wanted to say to Moses? Was it really that they just wanted to see which way they should go up into the land and uh, you know, to see which cities we should come to first? Or was it that they had heard there were giants in these lands and that the cities were really walled high? Go and see if that is true because that seems to have been what was the reasoning behind their lack of faith? How could we ever overcome this? You know, the interesting thing is that God had said, I'll use the hornet. You know, you think, if you look at a, a man like Goliath, you know, nine feet high, and, and you, you know, somewhere around six feet, and you're, this man's got this huge spear, and he's got an armor bearer in front of him, and you're going to take him on. If you look at him in terms, you might as well go away and hide somewhere like the rest of them. But if you, if you look at these things and you see this, this, God can do this in a number of ways. Like, he could cause him to have a heart attack. Right at the, at the time, he's fall dead. You know, God could call him that uh, he'd be clumsy. He's a big man. He might stumble and fall. I'll get him when he's down. Do we ever think of things like that? That how God could do things that were quite abnormal while he's sending the hornets and driving the people out of their defense cities? And maybe driving them out with any, without any preparation. So these men out, went out without even their arms to, of, of war to, to, to fight a battle. We don't know exactly how it is, but they were destroyed completely by the armies that went in. Now, it's looking at the facts of it that should give us the faith not to repeat that incident in our own life. It's to be able to see whatever obstacles we have, God is able to perform it. Like, how many times have we decided that we can't do something, we don't have the money? And yet, you ask a few brethren around about how other projects were financed, where you started off, we don't have the money. No money came. In ways we would never have thought of, we never could have predicted. So it wasn't a reason to stop because we didn't have the money. 
It, it wasn't, you know, a reason to stop because we couldn't see the way. Uh, I, I, many brothers and sisters have observed what's happened to us and trying to bring a couple little portable buildings in behind Book Road Hall so we can, uh, you know, improve our schools so that we can have a little bit more space. You know, we started the high school there, so we needed another room for that class, and, and uh, we have a skills portable in the making. But you wouldn't believe the difficulties we've had to go through with the city. Who told us to start with, we don't want you to do it. But you know, if you see something that is godly, like this is for the work of the truth, and we say, if this is for the work of the truth, then ask God for the blessing to overcome these obstacles. Not to see the obstacles, oh, we can't do it, because look at what they've said. And there'd be a few of us here who, who knew what happened. And Brother Ian could, could, could help you too, because he and I went down to the city and, and had to deal with an issue there where the, the city had told us, you, you can't do this. And so we appealed it to their own committee of appeal. And uh, when we went down there, we saw a list on the door. It said these were the times you had to go in, and they had given everybody about three minutes. That's all you had in front of this panel. So we looked at our time, and our time was already passed because they were in there and they were slugging it out with some developer who, who wasn't giving up or something. And when we went in, it was, it was uh, quite late. So the committee knew they were behind times, and the man that was going to oppose us had to take a break, a washroom break, but the person who was running the committee wanted to run it, so we went in there and we sat down and and we, we stated our case in 30 seconds, and within about 30 seconds, he said, okay, away you go. We'd won our case before the city council. After being told you can't do this for all these reasons, a man was just so disturbed, I think, because they were so late, that this was just a, this was just, you know, a little tiny issue, moving a portable, and they'd been dealing with this huge building they wanted to build downtown, so you know, let's get these little issues out of the way, and the man that was opposing us, he was in the washroom somewhere. <laughs> And then Brother Ian and I noticed that the man across from us in the table, his name was Abraham. And we thought, hey, we got him made it. <laughs> so I tell you, these, these things are in your mind. You, it really helps your attitude. But you can remember a few of these things, mainly the ones from the word of truth. But from your own experience, sometimes it helps you to go the way of the, of the Lord and, and do the things. And those people, I, I, don't, I didn't really read it very carefully, who are aspiring to a, 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 care, a home of care for elderly people, that's a wonderful initiative. We have so many elderly people, so many people that need care in that, it's distributed in here and all over the place, and certainly up in Ontario. That's a wonderful work. I know it's very costly, and I know finding land, and that's very costly, but if people have the initiative and they get behind it, I believe God bless those initiatives. Now look at this, brothers and sisters. You can't help but feel a little sorry for Moses. Here is this man commissioned to bring this nation into the land, and we just hear one event after another of how they really roughed him up. Well, in verse 13 of Numbers 11, he says to them, Whence should I have flesh to give all unto this people? Or he says this to God on behalf of what he had heard from the people. They weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I'm not able to bear all this people alone. It's too heavy for me. And if you deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand, I have, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. You ever felt like that? That's what they call getting at the end of your tether. Well, without losing it, Moses recognized he was very close to it. And you can well imagine with people coming to him, like you just have to put in and just think about what it would have been like for people who didn't have enough water and they were thirsty and people didn't have what they wanted to eat and they were hungry. And then multiply it by, what, a couple million. It's wonder he survived as long as he did. So he appeals to God, I'm not able to bear this people alone. Let me not see my wretchedness. In other words, he didn't want to see himself losing it. He must have been very close to it. So when we look at the next incident, 
Here's Moses tested again, dealing with pressure. Numbers 20, verse 10 and 11. Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, you rebels! Must we fetch you water out of this rock? And he lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. But he had not honored God. Now, I don't know whether that's what Moses saw as his wretchedness, but God had given him a way out. God says, I'll never try you beyond what you're able to bear. You've got to look for the way of escape. God gave him the way of escape. If they want water, go up and you speak to the rock, and water will come out. But he struck the rock, and he dishonored God. And he did not go into the land because of that. Look at this one. Amnon fell sick for his sister. You see, these are personal things. They're, they can be national things. They can be personal things. They can be family things. There's all kinds of issues in the Bible. That's where we go to find how to deal with our own situation. Get our Bible out get some prime time, read it, meditate on it, and ask God for strength. So it says, it came to pass that after this <clears throat> that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything unto her. I suppose if if we didn't know the next detail, we would have expected he'd just go through life like that until, you know, circumstances took it away from him. But it didn't because Amnon had a friend. His friend's name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother, related to him. And he was a very subtle man. And the word subtle means uh, astute. He was very... A strategic man. He was, he was, it doesn't suggest craftiness. It's not that word. But it's like, why wouldn't you know what to do? Kind of a thing. Here's, here's what you should do if that's the way you feel. You don't want a friend like that. And he was his friend. He was in a close advisor. You see, and the Bible goes on to, to tell us that the company you keep is related to the moral standards you have. And if you have bad company, don't expect your moral standards will go higher, they'll go weaker. Critical for us to understand that. And yet sometimes we lose control of it. It really is very disturbing, brothers and sisters, to hear reports that some parents don't know what their children are doing in their own house. And in particular with this electronic media, I'll be able to talk and converse with a total stranger. And the parents know nothing about it. To the point where the person will leave that house and go off and live with that person. Christadelphia. We've got to know what our children are up to. If they have a very subtle friend or advisor, we need to know that. We need to caution our children about this. You know, and I tend to think, as looking back on this, that the, really the only way to prepare kids for this would be to do it as soon as you can. You see these little kids running around and they, they just learn to be able to walk and they're, they're able to, to speak and they're able to communicate is to try to teach them at the earliest stage the fundamentals, uh, how to you know, have friends, how to, how to stand up for what God uh, believes, or, or what wants us to believe, rather, uh, to be able to memorize some Bible verses that if they can think of what the Bible verse is really saying, it will help them. Like anything that can put the Word of God in their head so that they have a little advantage that the man or the, the spiritual side of their head is more developed 
than the other side of their head when they come into the, the time of puberty. If we could do that, we could really help our children. But I find, and I'm sure that many of you have found, that circumstances in a house sometimes don't give you the ability to be one-to-one -one with children. But the safety I've found, which would, Sister Dorothy and I tried to build around, do your readings. And when you do your readings, don't skip a chapter like this in 2 Samuel. Read that chapter, explain to the kids. He had a friend, which was very subtle. I think he was going along not too bad, but when he had this friend and he followed his advice, it was deadly failure. You've got to be careful who you associate with. And to be able to have a relationship with mom and dad, that they communicate with us what they're thinking. Like we had one of our children did not communicate very well with us. And I was quite disturbed because he just wouldn't talk. Like you ask a question, oh. you know, get another grunt or something, but you never really get any real good answers. We found that at about 2 o'clock in the morning, after CYC playing floor hockey, they talk about anything. So you have to stay up till 2 o'clock in the morning after CYC when they'd be playing floor hockey and to have a good conversation with your kid, small price to pay. To know what's going on in that mind, what's, what's being thought, what's, what's, what are their plans, what are their, what are their, is their assessment of how things are going. We need to communicate with our kids and if they're constantly having these little cell phones and, and even allowed to have them in time when we would normally have meals and things, that is tragic because that is the time we would normally communicate with them. Well, we know what happened. We've read that record. But it is interesting to see in 2 Samuel 13, verse 15, that it says, Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise and be gone. Now that's the way sin is. It must have been that he just suddenly realized how foolish he had been. How much he had given in to something he was supposed to, you know, restrain those feelings, those propensities, the inclination of the flesh. Now what he do, would he do? He was the firstborn. He may very well have been in line to be the next king, but he just destroyed it all. Isn't that the way sin works? Our appeal for something and our desire for something is so strong, it just blinds us. If we had a good friend at that time, they might be able to keep us on the right road. But if we have a bad friend, that's what happens. Now, the Lord did not start off being angry with Solomon. He appeared unto him twice. He granted Solomon wisdom, wisdom that is still admired by people around the world. In 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 9 to 11, however, it was different because now Solomon had moved away from his own advice. He'd been trapped in the very things that he talked about that others should not be trapped in and should avoid because he either experimented with trying to see what would happen if you had a thousand wives. I can't explain how, how he ever came to achieve that number, but... It says, Yahweh was angry with Solomon because these wives brought with them their gods and their way of worship, and they corrupted Solomon. He built these places of worship around Jerusalem, which stayed through all the kings. It must have been more than just a, oh, I'll go and build just a little something on the hill. It must have been something like a covenant with the, with the people because they stayed through so many of the kings, even righteous kings, and they were still there. It was Josiah that removed those and destroyed them. It took all that time before what Solomon had done was erased from Judah. And Yahweh was angry with Solomon. Now you would just think with Solomon, with his wisdom, and with his memory of his dad and the experiences of his dad and how his dad had told him about forgiveness, and surely he would know about the feelings that his dad had, even though he may not have read the, uh, the Psalms which he wrote. So it, the way of forgiveness was open to him. 
But it says in verse 11, Wherefore Yahweh said unto Solomon, For as much as thou hast done, this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and I will give it to thy servant. And then in 1 Kings 11, verses 39 to 40, And I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. And Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt until Shishak, the king of, unto Shishak, the king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. See, that's the fleshly way of dealing with a problem that you don't want to admit. What could he do? He had all these wives. They were all dependent on him. He had got these various wives somewhat satisfied by giving them their ability to worship their God in Israel. What was he going to do? Well, he had dug himself a big pit. And to get out of that, he had to do an awful lot that would be very hard to do for him to do. I guess he thought the easiest way was to kill Jeroboam. But that's trying to stop what God had decided to do. Like there's no sense, certainly no spiritual sense, in going that avenue. Great right to the last king, Zedekiah. And I think it's uh, an interesting, if not wonderful, kind of thing to read that uh, Zedekiah was given by Jeremiah the opportunity to repent almost at the very last minute. But you've got to submit to the king of Babylon. You go out and, and uh, surrender to him. King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I'm afraid of the Judeans who have deserted to the Chaldeans. Thus I be handed over to them, and they deal cruel with me. And Jeremiah said, You shall not be given to them. Obey now the voice of Yahweh and what I say unto you, and it shall be well with you, and your life shall be spared. But it wasn't sufficient. And you just think, you see, these is, this is the mercy of God to provide us the latter end of this. To imagine this man taken captive, like he, exactly what Jeremiah had said came to pass, and he would have had time to think about it. He saw his two sons killed before his eyes, and then his own eyes put out and taken captive. So he wasn't just destroyed, he was given a little of what the world calls purgatory, a place of torment before he died, so that he could see the air of his ways and recognize the wisdom of God. Not that we ever see that he recognized it officially, but we don't know how he thought at the end. We go to Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, and you can see that God's still at it, trying to use the idea of bringing good out of evil. And, you know, the fourth part of the... Uh, or the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. The power was given unto him to scorch men of fire. And the men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. That's what God wanted. That's what evil was put there for. But they did not react to it. Now, I'd just like to skip over a few of these. We don't have time to go through there. But I would like to just look at this one. Can mankind bring good out of evil? Like how successful have men and women been at doing what God is good at? Well, in Proverbs 14, verse 12, it tells us, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So you just look at the world, and many of these things we can see. Thalidomide. It was a drug that was introduced for women that were pregnant and had, they had morning sickness. And it was to curtail the morning sickness. But there are people still out there you could see who have no arms and no legs because it was a very deforming drug for the fetus in the womb. Well, they thought they were bringing good out of evil, but they just brought more evil. Freon 12. Everyone thought it was wonderful to be in an air-conditioned room. We still think it is. But they didn't believe a molecule that big could ever get up into the sky that high that it could actually influence the ozone layer. And it did. And so that what people thought was bringing good out of evil actually brought more evil. 
plastics. This was man's ability to play God. We can create anything we want now by the fact we can, of material that we can create and we can form this or that or the other, but they don't degrade. Now they're starting to find, if you know, they have actually learned this for some years now, that they have problems with all the refuse plastics. The fossil fuel power problem. The DDT insect killer. Credit. Nuclear weapons. Cigarettes. Biological weapons. Opioids. On and on it goes. Man's idea of this is how we will deal with evil. We'll bring good out of it. And people see that, no, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The word of God is beautiful, brothers and sisters. It has the answers. We don't need to go beyond the book to find the answers for life. We'll leave it there this morning.